whether we sell conveyors, whether we build conveyors, make conveyors, use or work on conveyors, they have problems. And what I want to hopefully discover today is some of the five biggest problems that users face when they're not or things are missed during design, build, upgrades, or those early stages of conveyors. So let's get into it. Number five is mistakes with the transition. Okay, if you're not familiar with transition, transition is the distance between the flat tail pulley and the first fully troughed idler. That transitioning of the belt has to be done or should be done over enough real estate. If that transitioning of the belt is too short, it will damage the belt. So the transition distance is from this flat tail pulley to this first fully troughed idler. Now, I get a lot of questions about, well, what about this idler, Jared? That's what we call a transition idler. And it's there to support the belt. And it's important, but it doesn't change the overall real estate that's needed or length of belt that's needed to properly transition that belt to its fully trough. So this, for this discussion, this idler, although important, it's not relevant in how much transition distance we need. If the transition distance is too short, you're going to see damage right here in the middle thirds of the belt. Let me get into this a little bit deeper here for you to make some more sense out of this. This is a what I'm going to call a tension heat map. Tension, over tension in short distances can damage the belt. So what this heat map is showing you is the belt's tension as it transitions from the flat tail pulley to the first fully troughed idler. And you can see the blue is very lower tension compared to the green, which is a much higher tension. What's happening when you stretch or when you tension or when you trough that belt as that belt's developing its trough, the outer edges of that belt are being stretched under greater forces than the center of the belt. And that that's what creates this inconsistency in tension. And that's what can eventually damage the belt. So there is some transition distance recommendations, but they are only recommendations. Uh, so basically the transition distance recommendations from SEMA will depend on the trough ability or the uh, eventual trough of the belt, the tension rating of the belt or how much stretch is on the belt, and then whether it's fabric or steel cords. So basically what they're giving you in this chart is a factor to multiply times the width of the belt to get what that overall transition distance should be. I worked up an example for you on a 36 inch belt that's troughed to a 35 degree angle. That's at 80% stretch. You would take 36 times 2.4 because 2.4 is the factor that they tell you to multiply the belt width times. That's going to basically give you a need of about uh, more than seven foot of transition distance. So what they're saying is that the distance from the first fully troughed idler to the tail pulley should be more than seven foot. And a lot of conveyors don't have that. And then uh, the users, the guys that are on this webinar that said, hey, we're building or we're working on conveyors. We use conveyors or we're maintaining conveyors. That's the group that's sitting here joining with us today. They're just scratching their head and say, hey, what do I do about that belt damage? The other problem, and this might be even more significant, is when conveyors are designed and they're being loaded on that transition. The belt should be designed, the conveyor should be built in a way that the belt is fully troughed before it's loaded. If you don't fully trough the belt before it's loaded, it makes it very difficult to seal in material and very difficult to seal in air. So that's going to create excess spillage. That's going to create unnecessary dust. That's going to increase cleanup costs. That's going to cost 
lost material or lost product. And certainly, potentially, it's going to create citations from either OSHA or MSHA on housekeeping. So when you design or build or upgrade a conveyor, and don't take into account that that belt should be fully troughed before you load on it, what you've delivered to the user is a conveyor belt that's just not going to perform. It's no different than if you were building a car uh, or something like that and sold it, delivered it, built it, designed it, intended it for an end user and didn't intend it for an end user that was going to drive it to the points that are typical driving. These users must have conveyors that don't spill, don't dust, don't increase their cleanup costs. They're going to have problems with these belts if they're doing that or if specifically they're loading on the transition. Number four, lack of access. Let's talk a little bit about that. Maintenance staffs, operators, they've got to have access to inspect and e adjust the equipment. Now, we're going to recommend at Martin Engineering, if we're going to rebuild a transfer point, we're always going to recommend what we call head and shoulders access. What that means is we want our guys, we want your guys to be able to get an arm and a shoulder and maybe even a head into that opening so they can make adjustments or inspections. Inspection doors where you can just see are fine, but if you if the structure allows you to make a bigger access point where you can get an arm and a shoulder in there to make that job a little bit easier, that's going to be beneficial. And that's also going to make the job a lot faster as well. Now, one thing I need to add about inspection doors is you want to make sure that they're sealing properly. They've got to have a rubber gasket around it. You want to make sure it's not just metal on metal. If you have metal on metal without a rubber gasket to seal that door, and uh, a proper clamp to make sure that door's secured, you're probably going to have increased dust at that transfer point. So you want to make sure you look at this photo, the door at the top here doesn't look to be sealed and doesn't look to have anything to uh, fasten it shut. However, it's large. So I like that. The only thing I do differently here is I make sure there's a seal around it. Now, if you look at the door on the bottom, it's a little more of, uh, you can see that rubber seal around the outside. You can seal that there's a latch. That's going to keep that door shut. That's going to keep that air out of that transfer point. That's going to reduce dust on the other end. You want to make sure that components like belt cleaners, belts, any rolling component that might be sealed off with chute work, uh, they need to be available for maintenance and inspection. For the gang that are designing building conveyors, I'm going to give you a, a phrase that I often use in our live classes that tends to not get disagreement. Here's that phrase. Maintenance jobs that are tough to do don't get done. And the reason they don't get done is because a lot of these facilities, a lot of the mines, a lot of the process plants that you're building or designing conveyor for, they simply don't have the workforce to do those tasks that are very challenging to do. So if we give them component access on their conveyors, the likelihood of that maintenance being done quicker and safer and more often is a lot, lot greater for them. Components should be strategically placed and you want to make sure you take into consideration any safety considerations uh, with those um, inspection doors. So here's what I mean by that. If you're operating a conveyor, if you're using conveyor, maintaining conveyor, uh, you should make sure that uh, there's protocol that says that a worker will not break the plane. It's 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 fine to reach into those doors, inspection doors to access equipment but only when you're locked out and tagged out. Best in class safety regulations, gold bar standard for safety, the facilities that are really holding their workers accountable for being safe, usually have policies that says you do not break a plane, do not break the plane of a conveyor without it being locked out and tagged out. 
I want to show you, if you look at the photo on the right, you can see now you can buy inspection doors that have another level of security to them or another level of safety by adding a panel in there to eliminate certain people's ability to access. All right, number three, insufficient ceiling distance. Gang, keep in mind, we're working from worst to the, the, the least significant to the most significant problem. And number three, insufficient belt ceiling. That's really starting to get to be more and more problematic. Uh, here's what we're re referring to when we talk about insufficient um, ceiling distance. And that's the edge distance from the belt. So if you look at this photograph, you can see the shoot wall here vertically, and you can see the edge of the belt. The, what I'm talking about is this distance right here, the distance from that skirt board to the edge of the belt. Now, keep this in mind throughout this discussion. This belt's going to track a little bit from side to side. Hopefully, it's not going to track significantly poorly, but it may. And it'll probably move a little bit from side to side. That's one of those things that we just have to deal with as conveyor operators that our belts tend to mistrack. So... What I look in the as I look in this photo, I can see my edge edge distance, this free belt edge, as we call it, is X. But as I'm running this conveyor and it wears weighs from side to side, that distance might be anywhere between X and Y. It's going to vary a little bit. So SEMA has a formula that tells you how much free edge belt you would need. And that formula, it's on, it's in SEMA 7. It's uh, the free belt edge equals 0 0.055 times the belt width plus 0 0.09. The problem with that formula is that it only provides usually a couple of inches of free belt edge, like you see in this photo. Most facilities are dealing with dust problems. One of the ways that they're dealing with dust problems is they're making uh, they're buying improved, better, what we call double-lipped skirting. Okay, they're not using what you see in this photo. What you see in this photo tends to not do the job with the amount of dust that's acceptable at some of these plants. So they need to use a more heavy-duty skirting. Those heavy-duty skirtings are usually much wider than that two inches that that SEMA design standard states. They're usually about three inches to four inches. So that's what you're seeing in this photo. If you look in this photo, this free belt edge, on, on you look at the bottom left of your screen, you can see that there's uh, about three or four inches that skirting sits on there very nicely. If that belt were to mistrack a bit, it's going to allow for that. If you look at the diagram on the right, that's going to kind of show you how those double lipped more real estate um, is needed for those double lip skirting. I want to share this with you real quick here. Um, this is a this is a chart and this tells you uh, kind of what the shoot work width should be depending on the belt width and the trough angle. So if we take a 36 inch belt, we're going to drop to 35 degrees. We've actually narrowed that belt up to 31.7 inches once we've troughed it. That means the shoot work should only be 24 inches in width, and that's going to allow enough free belt edge. Inadequate belt cleaning. So if you're not familiar with Martin Engineering, if this is the first time you've ever joined one of our webinars and you're not really knowing what Martin Engineering does, well, we do a lot of things, but one of the most significant things that we're known for is our belt scrapers. So you know I cannot leave this off. Carry back at a facility is incredibly detrimental. And it's amazing how, even in 2023, how many facilities we visit who have inadequate belt cleaning. So we want to make sure that we're able to scrape that carry back off those belts significantly. Because inadequate belt cleaning is going to lead to belt mistracking problems. Material builds up on the rollers. Then those rolling components get out around. The belt starts to wander. Carryback leads to lost material, leads to excess dust and spillage, increased cleanup costs, premature equipment failure, 
citations. And then the biggest concern that we got to do, and guys, if you've joined us before, if you've seen any of the webinars I've done on conveyor safety, if you've seen any of our live classes, if you've read any of our books, you know the most significant hazard to workers around conveyors are the guys cleaning and shoveling materials, cleaning and shoveling up spilled material or carry back. So we've got to make sure we get that under control. All right, let's talk about some belt cleaning kind of minimum standards, minimum expectations here. These are what I consider the absolute minimums. This is, if you're running a conveyor, if you're designing a conveyor, building a conveyor, working on a conveyor, if you don't have this, you're way behind. You should be doing more than this. This is like low, low level stuff here that needs to be done. You got to have a primary and you got to have a secondary. It's amazing the facilities that I go to that are still only using a primary cleaner. If you're only using a primary cleaner, you're probably only going to get 40 to 50% of the carry back eliminated. Okay, another belt cleaning absolute minimum that I need to share with you. Number two, they've got to be professionally specified. If you're building conveyors and selling conveyors, you tend to buy the cheapest belt cleaner that you could put on that conveyor belt, and then out it goes. Okay, that's not a professionally specified belt cleaner. There's a lot that goes into making sure you've got the right belt cleaner for the application. There's different duties of belt cleaners. There's different types of tensioners. There's different types of blades. There's different shapes to blades. There's tons of different urethane compositions that will change depending on the material. And all that has an impact on how well those primary cleaners and secondary cleaners are going to perform. All right, number three, metal tipped secondaries. Primary belt cleaners can be urethane. That's fine. Secondary cleaners, they've got to be tungsten carbide or stainless steel, some sort of metal. There's lots of urethane secondary belt cleaners out there. They're not going to get the job done. If you're concerned about a metal secondary with your splice, let me know, and I'll talk you through how that can work. Finally, I need to share this with you. There's new technology out there that some of you may not be aware of. We've introduced this new belt cleaner maybe a couple of years ago now. It's called the Clean Scrape. And traditional belt cleaners are going to use that urethane primary cleaner. This Clean Scrape is a tungsten carbide primary cleaner. And it performs fantastic compared to urethane. And it lasts a much longer period of time. So there's less maintenance and blade changes compared to a urethane belt cleaner. Now, this is a premier belt cleaner. This is only for the facilities that want the highest level of clean belts out there. If, uh, if this is just a facility that, hey, they don't have a problem with uh, shoveling material up, they're fine with that. This is not uh, the, the cleaner for you. But if your challenge, if you're getting, if you're not getting the results with traditional belt cleaner, I would urge you to take a quick look at this. So I'm going to try to see if I can run a video here. I don't think this is going to run for me, gang. Uh, but what you can see here is this belt cleaner installs radically different than a traditional belt cleaner. And you can see here just the edges of that tungsten carbide tipped. Now, I purposely chose this photo because this works this belt cleaner works very, very well with mechanical splices, um, which seems like it shouldn't, but it certainly does. I get this question all the time. What about specialty cleaners, brushes, beater bars, things like that? Well, they'll clean the belt. Um, they're not, the, you know, the traditional belt cleaner method is primary cleaner out of urethane, secondary cleaner out of tungsten carbide. That's what's going to get you to 90%. A lot of facilities are using these, and that's fine. We tend to believe uh, that they're not as effective as that model that I just described. However, your applications might be a little bit different, and your expectations of a clean belt might be a little bit different, and therefore something like these uh, may be appropriate just depending on the condition of your belt, the material, all those types of things. All right, number one. Here we go. We're going to go through number one. 
and then we'll wrap this up, gang. I see it all the time, and I just feel it's way overlooked, and I feel it's such an easy problem to fix. Here we go. Number one, not expecting the belt to miss track. Every conveyor belt I see, that belt's going to wander at some point in time in another, either when it's warm or when it's cold, when the material's wet or when it's dry, when I'm there or when I'm not there. Some point in time, these conveyors miss track. And that's such a significant problem in manpower trying to fix it. And it's so preventable, gang. Here's how we're going to talk about this a little bit. So the problems with belt mistracking is that can cause structural damage. You can see in this photo that belt's rubbed into the bracket. That's very problematic. You've got to avoid that. It can cause belt damage. And you see in these two pictures, edge damage. Now, we're getting reports. This is uh, kind of something that we've been hearing for the last year or so. But we're starting to hear specifically in the, the kind of the southeast part of the U.S., in the mining industry, we're starting to hear that some of these facilities are getting citations for edge damage. If you have comments on that, I'd love to hear any insight that you have. So drop us a note if you have insight on that. But we are starting to hear some of these facilities are getting citations because of edge damage. So you've got to prevent that belt from mistracking. And then constant adjustments. When you deliver or build, or design, or upgrade a conveyor belt that doesn't have already installed belt tracking devices, what you've delivered to the end user is a job, a task that they probably don't have a lot of time to solve, that they probably don't have a deep enough understanding to solve, and then they probably have lots of other things that are a higher priority. What you've given them is a big headache when you don't assume that that belt will mistrack at some point in time. Because what they're going to do is they're going to send a guy out with a hammer. And what's that guy going to do when he goes out to that hammer? With that hammer, he's going to just he's gonna start beating the hell out of whatever he can find. Whatever he thinks can make an adjustment, going to start beating on it. All right. That's a challenging, and what he's going to probably do is going to come back and do it again the next day. That's a very challenging piece of equipment to deal with. It's just constant adjustments that tend to not correct the problem or only correct the problem short term. So here's my recommendation. Add or include the products that are almost always needed to aid in correcting any potential belt mistracking. There's what we call passive devices, which would be crowned head pulleys, V rollers, any simple, simple tracking devices would be considered a passive device. Those help keep the belt centered. But we also want to talk a little bit about what we call dynamic devices. Now, dynamic devices are almost never included on the original design or spec or build of a conveyor belt, and they should be because they are significant in reducing the belt's likelihood to mistrack. What dynamic devices do is they react precisely and instantly to any wander or any mistracking that that conveyor belt might have. What happens is the belt bumps into the guide roller that you see here, so this is our guide roller, as that belt bumps into that guide roller through linkage, it makes an adjustment to either a carrying idler or a return idler to make adjustments, constant, precise, instant adjustments to that idler through the linkage, like you see in this diagram. And that's really a critical component that should be considered. All right, let's talk a little bit more about placement of these units because that's important. So if you're building, designing, or upgrading conveyor and you use one of these units, look very closely at point A, B, and C. So A is right here before the belt enters the tail pulley. 
B's right here as the belt exits the transfer point. And then finally C right here just before the belt discharges its cargo. Here's why we recommend these belt tracking units be placed at A, B, and C. A, you want that belt loaded. You want that belt tracking properly before it enters the load zone. Now, you could potentially add one here, but chances are because of our number five oversight, you don't have the real estate there. If you had the real estate there, I'd put it there, but probably you don't. So you want to put one right here. So as that belt enters that tail pulley, as long as that tail pulley is square and aligned, that belt's going to continue to track properly as it's loaded. Very important. The most critical spot to install a unit is right here. As the belt's being loaded, that can throw it out of alignment a little bit. So you want to realign it after it's loaded. That's why we recommend point B. And then finally, you should consider putting one at point C. And the reason for that is if this belt is dumping onto another belt, we want this belt to be centered before it disloads or discharges its cargo. That's going to help the receiving belt be centered and keep dust and spillage at a minimum on that receiving belt. So, boy, if you want to do your clients a solid when you're building, designing, you're specking, or upgrading conveyor belt, you should include these units at point A, B, and C. Now, they have some limitations. These are specifically... These limitations are going to be specific to uh, dynamic devices. Uh, they have about a 70 to 150 foot. That depends on belt speeds a little bit. So um, those passive devices, much less of an impact. Um, they won't have the reach that a dynamic device does. But a dynamic device also has a limitation to its reach or its ability to affect proper tracking.